some of you came up for the first time, you'll get to hear from me, so that's exciting. Um, uh, Jim asked me if I wanted to preach. Actually, he was planning on being gone today, but obviously he's not. Uh, so he asked me if I'd preach. I he tried to have me preach every so often. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, I'll tell you that as I was thinking about what to preach about, my, my primary thought was um, for our, our church as a, as a body and, and just um, especially those who are, are with us like all the time. And so um, I'm going to have some things to say that I think will be beneficial for, for those of you who, you know, we see you sometimes and we're glad that you're here. But I'm, I especially had in mind um, just kind of our, our people that are here all the time and, and just some, some encouragement for them. Um, but like I said, I think they'll still take some away from this if, if uh, that doesn't, isn't you. And so I'm excited about that. Let me pray and ask God to, to help us out here, and then we'll dive in. Father, thanks so much for giving us the time to open your word. Uh, we need to hear from you. You are an author of life, and uh, you're the one who is all wise. And uh, we just want to hear from you. We want to know what you have us do, how you have us act. And uh, God, I pray you just remind us from your word of, of your love and just your, your steadfastness towards us. I pray that you speak through me, God. I just want to say the things that you say. I pray you help us. And I pray you help us understand your word. You know, spiritual things, spiritual things are spiritually discerned. So we need your help. Jesus, I just love you so much. Okay, well, we're going to have a, a fun time in the book of Revelation today. Um, what? What? No. Um, this is actually the, the less crazy part of Revelation. We're going to be looking at the letters that uh, John writes to the churches. So we're not going to go all eschatological on you. We're not going to be looking at end time stuff so much. Uh, we're really just going to be looking at what did uh, what did Jesus have to say to some of the churches that were around at that time? What were some of the uh, critiques and some of the encouragement that he had to give them? So, if you want to go ahead and open to Revelation chapter 1, that's where we're going to start. Okay. We're going to start in Revelation 1, verses 4 through 8. Give me a second to get there. Alright, let's read. It says, John, to the seven churches that are in Asia... Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the cloud, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Alright, so this is kind of our, our introduction to what's going on here. Uh, you'll notice in verse 4 that it says, John. That means from John. He's, he's getting ready to write this book to these specific people, and so he says, from John to the seven churches who are in Asia. So that would probably be Asia Minor. But anyway, so we're, we're about to read some letters from, uh, from the Apostle John to those seven churches. Uh, I want to highlight some things that, that he says kind of in an introduction to the letters. Uh, the first thing I want you to notice that as he's writing, he has the glory of Jesus mind that uh, that's that's really um, just at the forefront. Uh, verse 6 he says, to him be glory and dominion forever. Um, and he's going to talk about uh, several things. But I want to just highlight and remind us that this is what's in the mind of G or in the mind of John as he's writing these letters. Verse uh, in verse 5 he says, and uh, grace from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead. I want to remind you that, that Jesus is the first first one to be resurrected and, and that uh, he's not the last one. That for us who are in Christ, there is a resurrection coming. And that's, that's our hope. That this is something that is 
foundational for the way that he's gonna gonna write these letters. Um, he says in going on verse five, he says, "To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood." I want to remind you again that John has in mind Jesus as the one who has died in our place for our for our evils, the things that we've done uh, against God. But Jesus is the one who has died in our place. That his blood covers our sin, just like uh, Jim talked about the promise in the Book of Genesis. This is still the theme of the Bible all the way to the end. That Jesus would be the one to cover our shame. He's the one who is, is covering our sin. So this is this is what is in the mind of John as he's writing. And um, one more one more thing as well. He says that he's made us a kingdom and priests to his Godfather. So he has in mind us being servants to God. <coughs> we are we're the ones who are to tell people about Jesus. We're the ones who are serving. God, that, that that's that's part of what it means to be a Christian. So all, all of these pieces are are in the back of John's mind as he's writing. So now we're going to skip ahead to chapter two, <coughs> verses one, and and we're going to see that uh, Jesus gives specific things for John to write to each of these seven real churches in Asia at at this time. Like this is, you know, if you were to, to put yourself in that that mindset, you'd be like. Jesus says to to the church at Maryville, "This is what I have to say to you." Like this, so that's the, that's the mindset that we're going into here. Is that there's, you know, John is writing to real churches from Christ, and as we read these, um, like I said, I, I want you to keep in mind these are real churches, but they, they have real problems, and you're going to see he's going to highlight some of those, um, but he's also going to going to highlight some things that they're doing well and. Uh, and say, hey, keep on, keep doing these things. So even just as you read, I, hopefully you're going to be pulling out things like, hey, yeah, that's that's good. I should be. I need to need. To, I, I need to work on that, or I need to think about that, or or just a reminder that Jesus is pleased with us because He died died in our place. That, that it's not that it's not about oh, if I can only do enough good, then He'll be happy. So we're we'll focus in on some of those things as we go. Um, I came here because although we have lots of letters to different churches in the New Testament, Paul writes several letters, Peter, and you know different. We have we have letters to the churches, but they're longer. This is really concise, like short. You know, Jesus says, "Hey, this is what you're doing good. This is what you're not doing good." Boom, and and so it's really short. And, and I'm hoping that that will make it a little easier for us to digest and pull some things out of. So, uh, starting in chapter two, verse one, to the angel of the church in Ephesus, write. The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you've not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Yet this you have. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. To the angel of the church in Smyrna write, The words of the first and the last who died and came to life. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich, and the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to come throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. And to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, The words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, yet you hold fast my name, and you did not deny my faith even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, 
so that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira, write, The words of the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your works, your love and faith and service and patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Behold, I will throw her onto a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her I will throw into great tribulation, unless they repent of her works, and I will strike her children dead. <coughs> and all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart, and I will give to each of you according to your works. For to the rest of you in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, you, I say, I do not lay on you any other burden. Only hold fast what you have until I come. The one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron, as when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my Father. And I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Okay, we've got three more. Let's hold on for three more letters. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember, then, what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Yet you have still a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, The words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, and who shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. I know it. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who said that they are Jews and are not, but why? Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Because you have kept my word about patient, my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. I'm coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may see your crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven and my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may be rich, and white garments, so that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and salve to anoint your eyes, so you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him, and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. All right. First of all, I just, sometimes I think it's really good to read, to read. Large section Paul exhorts Timothy, hey, don't don't give up uh, public reading of scriptures, and I think um, that the Spirit can can teach us 
this is yeah, the reason of words. I'm sure you guys have probably heard some things that I'm not going to kind of focus on, but I, I pray that uh, you guys have, have learned some things that even I'm not going to say. Um, but as we go through this, I want to focus on two letters uh, to the churches because I think uh, these two letters, is, I think, reflect sort of the, the state of our own church here. Um, and, and so I think we can we can be encouraged and exhorted by those. And the two letters that I want to focus on are the letter to uh, the church in Ephesus and the letter to the church in Thyatira. So um, let's let's just start with the, the letter to the church at Ephesus. Um, in, in chapter 2, verse 1, it says, I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. Jesus says, hey, you guys are working hard for my name's sake, and I love that. That's great. Um, you're, you're enduring hardship for my name, and that's great. Um, I want you to keep on holding, holding on, on and, and trusting me through these things. And, and he says, I know that you hate uh, false teaching, and, and that's great. Keep on, keep on doing that. And honestly, I, I really see those things happening in our church, so I want to encourage you guys. Hey, this is, this is good. I see in this church I, a lot of people who are zealous to make Jesus known that you guys, you're working hard. You are, um, your goal is, is that the gospel would be advanced, and that is awesome that we're working hard. You know, he says... As well, he says, um, you're bearing up under hardship. And, and, you know, I think that there are, are things that, that we go through hardship for, for the gospel here, but um, I think a lot of times that's not. And praise God that we're not always, you know, being hugely persecuted for, for the gospel, that we're not getting kicked out of our houses and arrested and things. Um, but I, I'm confident after seeing, you know, just seeing the way that you guys live, that the Spirit would give us the grace to endure those things that uh, those are things we would, would be happy to go through for His name. Um, and, then, and then the last thing, like I said, he, he encourages the church in Ephesus that they have tested those who claim to be apostles but aren't. That they've seen their, the works of those those people. And um, it's interesting because if you if you read some of these some of the letters that Paul writes, you see some of the same things going on that Jesus addresses here. Uh, when, when Paul writes to the church in Corinth, he says, he, he mentions these super apostles that, you know, they talk themselves up, but but they're they're just not about Jesus. They're really about gathering and following themselves. And, and so the same thing has come to Ephesus, and, and Jesus says, hey, you you remembered what I heard, what I said about there's going to be false teachers coming in among you like sheep and Sheep and wolves, or wolf in sheep's clothing, and um, you'll know them by the works. And, and here we see, church in Ephesus said, "Hey, you know, you're coming in preaching some other gospel, you know, and, and yet you're you're not living out this faith that, that Jesus proclaimed. You're not um, you have you have not love for others. You have not all these other things. And so um, they were like, okay, well, you know, we're not going to listen to you. And Jesus praises them for that. And I see." In, in this body, a love for truth and a love for doctrine that, that I really want to say, hey, that's awesome, and encourage you guys. Um, keep on. Truth is important, and it's not something to be thrown aside. And Jesus praises the church in Ephesus for that. Don't don't just go after whatever teaching or, or you know, whatever teacher there might be. That, that Realize there are people out there who are false teachers, and their, their point is they want you to come and follow them, whether it's to give money to their church or just to to have a lot of people like them, you know, that's a big thing in America right now. Like, I'm going to preach whatever it is that people want to hear so that they'll come to my church. And they'll never say that, but that's a real thing. That's a real thing, that there are a lot of people who change the message so that, you know, and, and in saying these things, I'm not trying to build us up as though we're, this group is a perfect example of, of following Christ, but I think sometimes we need encouragement. And so I want to remind you, we are doing some things well. Now, in this letter, he has, he has one thing that he cautions the church at Ephesus about. He says in verse 4, I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, the works you did at first. If not, or remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Now, 
as, as I was studying, what, is, what does it mean to love, to lose the love you had at first? Uh, there's two different ways that I found that we can take this, and I think they're both validly important. The first one is um, you know, we, we lose our, our affection for Christ. You know, as we, we forget so fast that Jesus is, is better than everything else. And we forget that very fast. And so I think that's one thing that he may mean. You know, do you have a desire for um, relationship with him? Do you have a desire, you know, because this can really quickly become, yeah, I'm working super hard for the gospel, and I'm just worn out, and I'm not, I don't really have affection for Christ, but I'm just, I'm working really hard for, I don't even know anymore. You know, you just get worn out. And so I think, that's one thing that this can definitely be pointing to is you know, be careful that, that that's not you. And if it is, you know, I'm not, I'm going to be honest, this is one I don't have an answer for. He says, repent and do the works you did at first. I, perhaps he's saying, what are the things that kindle your affection for Christ? What are those things? Because if, if your affections for Christ are dwindling so that you're, you're not, you're no longer motivated to to seek him, him, not his, not his works, not his, you know, the building up of his church, not the whatever, but him, if you're not motivated to seek him, what are the things that kindle your affections for Christ? Is that, you know, sometimes for, for me that means, man, I'm just so overwhelmed, I need to take some time and, and just go, you know, one thing for me that's really, really nice is I play the guitar just a little bit. If I go and I'll just play a couple worship songs, I'm just like, man, this is great. I can miss this. And and before I do it, I'm I don't I'm not feeling it. I'm I'm not. But then I go and I, I just have a time of personal worship with God, and that's really just one of those things. Or going and finding a sermon that just and it doesn't even necessarily have to be like about okay, well let let me let me learn how to do this better as a Christian. Sometimes it's just let me go and listen to a sermon about how great Jesus is because I need to be reminded and and just you know how he's so much more important than the things of this world. And, and that can be really encouraging and can rekindle our affections. But the other thing, and I was talking to Jim about this, and, and this was something I hadn't considered, was in this context, Jesus is talking about, okay, you've tested the words of the apostle, these false apostles and found them to be false. You've tested uh, the Nicolaitans and their doctrines of, of uh, I, I think the Nicolaitans have some teachings on like sexual morality is great, go for it. I, I'm not certain on that. But these two different like brands of false teaching are kind of sandwiched this piece where he says, but you've forgotten your first love. And it, it may be that in their zeal for right doctrine, they forgot how to love people. When you first started, you, you were you were doing great at, at loving people, and, and uh, you know, but now in your your zeal for doctrine, you've, you've you've segregated yourself out. We're not we're not part of those people, and we're not part of those people, and so everybody needs to just kind of stay back because we're the we're the ones that are right in our doctrine, and so um, we can't we can't have I don't know. There just becomes this prideful mindset. There becomes this. Um, we forget that we need to show love in tangible ways to people, even even that have bad doctrine, <coughs> even especially those who just don't know Jesus. If they don't have their lives together, we we start to set up this criteria for well, if you're this, this, and this, then I love you. But if you don't have right doctrine, or you you don't have your life together, you're, you know things are a mess, then I I can't show love to you because whether that's a waste of time or, or whatever, and, and we forget that God sends rain on the just and the unjust, and that um, he's called us to feed the least of these and, and to help the least of these, and he says when you when you do that, you've done it unto me, and, and so this is just an encouragement as well, like, I think here we're very zealous for right doctrine, and that is awesome, that's great, keep on that, but in the midst of that, be careful that you don't get built up in pride and that you don't uh, forget how to love those who are maybe don't meet all your criteria that you're thinking about. Um, that's, that's real important. That if all we have is right doctrine, we don't display Christ and Christ is not happy with that. Yes? I think that's probably the way because 
the word that is translated as love is quite often translated as charity. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Especially. Yeah, that's very so true. So we say faith, hope, and love, but a, a lot of translations are faith, hope, and charity, so it's the extending of that love. That, that agape, that kind of love that does unto others without expectation of you know being uh, loved in return, that, that acts in ways that are beneficial to others even when that's not reciprocated. So um, those are those are my uh, encouragements from the letter that, to the Ephesians and then my, my exhortation there. Um, I want to jump down to the letter to the church of Thyatira. Now you're going to read this and go, whoa, what does this have to do with, with our church? But I think, uh, let, let me walk you through it and, and, and we'll see. So uh, let me just read the whole thing and get your, your mind back there and, and let, let it shock you for a second and then we'll have a good discussion. Um, verse 18. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, the words of the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your works, your love and faith and service and patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Behold, I will throw her onto a sick bed, and those who commit adultery with her I will throw into great tribulation, unless they repent of her works, and I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart, and I will give to each of you according to your works. But to the rest of you in Thyatira who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, to you I say, I do not lay on you any other burden. Only hold fast with my hands until I come. The one who conquers and who keeps my who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron, as when earthen pots are broken in pieces. Even as I myself have received authority from my Father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So, first of all, you're going <coughs> what? <laughs> This church supports Jezebel? And, no. Okay, so when I look at the church, this letter to the church in Thyatira, I see a couple things. I see that there's two groups here. There's this group of people who are, are accepting or at least tolerating this, this uh, person who's teaching uh, sexual immorality is great. Uh, go eat food offered to idols, that's great. Thumbs up. Um, and Jesus talks about bringing uh, judgment, that he's the one who's going to make it clear what's good and what's not. But there's this other group, verse 24 says, but to the rest of you in Thyatira who do not hold this teaching. So we've, we've got this, these two groups. And I, this to me sounds very much like the church in Maryville, the church in America, that um, sexual morality is, is just a huge, huge topic and a huge deal right now. And you know, whether it's uh, you know, just whatever form of uh, sexual morality is okay. Or, and and I, when I say that, every one of you thinks, okay, LGBT relationships. And, and sure, I want to talk about that, but not only that, but even just, hey, let's have this open relationship and that's okay. And we'll just sleep around. Or, or let's just, uh, you know, that sex is, is great in any setting, in any circumstance, and, and just that's the mindset. And and the church, when I say the church, I mean people who are calling themselves Christians and, and who are teaching as though they're they're teaching things from God have, have stepped back and just said, whatever you want to do is great. That's good. Thumbs up. And this is the kind of thing that, that Jesus is, is saying to the church in Thyatira. There's, you know, there's teaching about sexual morality going on that's just rampant that sexual morality is good and and that is that's the church in America as, as a whole but I, I want you to know that that's the church in Maryville too That and I, I don't have specific names and I'm not going to give specific names but I will tell you there are churches in Maryville who are in, would have nothing to say about alternative sexual lifestyles meaning you want to stay around that's great um whether it's you know, gay and lesbian re- sexual relationships, that's great. And, and they'll give their approval and thumbs up and even say, hey, why don't you come and, and teach us because we need to learn 
about sexual sexual ethics from you, so why don't you come and, and be our pastors and be our these things? And that's here in Maryville, right? So this is this is the climate in Maryville, just as it was in Thyatira. So I think we can very, very well relate to this. Um, so when I hear that, I think, hey, that sounds kind of like America and kind of like Maryville. But he says some good things, and, and I, I think this is kind of <coughs> interesting and telling. Verse 19, he says, I know your works, your faith and love, your service and patient endurance, that your latter work exceed the first. That's really interesting to me. Um, because as I think about some of the churches, even in Maryville, that, that do very well at serving people and loving people, you know, I don't want to discount that. Um, but I think you know, we fall into that as well, that we're, as a body, really trying to serve and love people in tangible ways. Um, but he says, but, but that does not excuse your sexual morality. That doesn't excuse these things. So I, I, find, that, I find that really interesting. But... Scroll down to, to verse 25. He says, to this group that's not holding these teachings about sexual immorality, he says, um, no, verse 24. He says, to, to the rest of you in Thyatira who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, to you I say, I do not lay on you any other burden. Only hold fast what you have until I come. And I know... The, the temptation and the struggle of working hard for the name of Jesus. And, and like I said in the letter to the Ephesians, like we're working hard. And, and, and I know the temptation to think, ah, we just need to do one more thing, and then God will be happy with what we're doing as a church. You know, we're, because I, I know that as a group, we are trying to reach Maryville with the gospel, and that's our, that is our driving goal. And sometimes we see we see small bits of fruit from that, but sometimes we feel like there's no fruit. And so our our thought is, man, if only we were doing the right thing, if we could just add this thing, then God would be happy with what we're doing. But when we see the church in Thyatira, like they're working hard, they're they're serving people, they're loving people, they're trying to make the gospel known, they're holding to the true doctrine. Jesus doesn't say hey, what you're doing is good, why don't you add this other thing too, and then add this other thing too, and, and I just want to remind you that, I mean, Jesus says, I don't have another burden to lay on you. When, when Jesus talks and says, come to me, you who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest, that, that our acceptance is in Jesus, and he is satisfied with us, that we're holding on to him by faith, and he is satisfied with us, as a church, as we do that, and, and I know that I, I I know the people here, and I can say, you guys love Jesus, and you're holding on to Him, and you want to make Him known, and you are serving. And so I want to I just want to encourage you. Jesus is going to have to lay some extra burden on you. He's already paid it. It's already done. Keep on, keep on, and uh, you're accepted in Him. So. With, with these two these two letters that, that we're focusing on here, like I said, I, I want to remind you our purpose here, just like John's purpose in writing, is, is to think about that we're here for the word of Jesus, and he's the exalted one, and, and to remind you that in the grand, in the grand scheme of things, we're doing well as a church and committing to faithfully teach and live out the gospel. So feel like you're doing it. I, I want you to feel, to feel that. Feel like because when I read these letters to the churches, I, I don't go, oh man, you know, I think this is the, this is the one Jesus was writing to us. I, I want you to know that I think Jesus would be, would be pleased with us as a church. And I, I think ultimately Jesus doesn't have another burden to lay on us. He would say, carry on, and, and you're accepted in me. So. What what are some things in these letters that stand out to you? What are some things that you would say, hey, you know, maybe the Jesus would have had this to say to us as a church as, as you went through these? Um, this is one of those one of those sermons where it's not like I'm not necessarily trying to give you a, a big doctrinal thing. I'm not necessarily trying to give you okay, now this because the Bible said that right there, that means we need to whatever. This is just me saying, 
hey, when I look at, at these letters, I see some encouraging things and some things to watch out for, and, and so I want to bring those to your attention. Yeah, Dave. Well, I was in that class every, well, uh, every one, but several at least, and was encouraging. Repeated phrase usually starts something like you had, you know, the spirit says to the churches, and then being confident will not be hurt by the second death. Um, if he even conquers, I'll be somewhere in that. He who conquers, the peace one works till the end, I'll be in power over the nation. In other words, hold on to what you've got. Keep, keep true, there's a reward coming. There will be a reward for you. It's, you know, yeah, the glory of Jesus to look forward to. And it's and not on this earth. That's right. And so to hold fast the faith that we have and, and the, the struggle that we have in trying to make the man hold fast to his hope to look forward to. Yeah. Um, you know, the news throughout the many days of how you say, uh, you must know, repent for it and repent. Uh, and how there's no ultimatum. You're not like that you used to be in that nature of your mind during the day of your life and your mind and your time to keep on faith. But repent and follow me. Right. Return to what you did in your life. And just, I think it's really important to remember as an individual and as a church that, um, you know, hope isn't lost even when the church loses its direction, but it's lost when you no longer recognize it. And that's true of us individually as well. I mean, in this letter, opportunity. Yeah, in this letter to the church of Thyatira, in verse uh, twenty-one, it says, "I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent." Jesus doesn't say, "Oh, we messed up there now," you know, and then. But God is patient with us, and, and He is. <laughs> He, he disciplines those he loves, and we read that in another one of, one of these letters, and, and just remind you, yeah, that he's not out to punish you, but, you know, you're his children, and so he's, he's out to lead you. He's serving those who are weak. That's right. He, he disciplines us to bring us into, into righteousness and to help us walk in that path, but not, he's not out to just, you know, hey, you messed up, you're done. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, you mentioned Tyler Tyler. <laughs> Excellent morality. I was part of the church here in Maryville until recently. But that was a, one of their things. And, and I just had to leave. You know, not because I was stoned, stoned or anything, but it became uh, an issue. Yeah. And so people were saying, well, you know, it's okay, cool. Yeah. There's a huge temptation in this country now. A lot of the traditional churches are seen there. Yeah. And Romans go down. Yeah. And there's a lot of pressure from the culture, um, from people to blame of these teachings and act as though these teachings are not the word of God, that they are a reflection of the culture of the times only, and therefore don't, I mean, this is how they tempt you. This is, well, that, that's just because that was the culture back then, and they, they didn't really mean it. And then absolutely, and if Jesus were here today, he'd say it was all right. What he sent them an email telling them that, I guess, you know. But that's what they'll do. And it is tempting when you remember a church that used to be bursting at the seams and now it was less than half full. Is what can we do to bring these people in? Well, this is what they feel. So if we embrace that, then they'll come and it's a lie. I think the word that stands out to me in that second letter is to tolerate. Yep. In God's sight, then if not, it will not be tolerated. And and that is the mantra of the church. There's such a tolerant attitude. Um, but the words of, of, of the wounds of a friend are faithful. We're not we don't. <laughs> we don't. We do not get into each other's business as deeply as I think scripture calls us to do. 
if we were doing that, I mean, honestly, we're probably we're probably tolerating things that we might have seen in each other's lives when we don't have the boldness to. And that is that is the outplaying of a sense of the church discipline process. And it's not for condemnation, it's for restoration. I, I cannot help you if I let you pillow your head on your sin. You have to know when you probably don't see it. Or if you do, you found a way to cauterize it so it's not a big deal to you anymore. I don't know, is that a Bible verse, like, mind, or maybe the heart goes great in ways to justify some things, or is that just the case? I don't know, but, like, it's applicable. Like, you'll go to great, like, oh, I do this, but, oh, it's not really that bad, or, oh, Jesus is, like, perfect, and so it's okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's kind of Bible verse, like, like, if you're harvesting, like, in our own lives, which we're talking about through this, and it's like, in our own lives, like, our sin is justified, or, like, mm-hmm. God condemns over that. We were talking about this encouragement in uh, the church of Smyrna that we talked about in verse 9. It says, I know your tribulation, I know your poverty, but you were rich. I know the slander. And it goes on to say, do not fear what you're about to suffer. <clears throat> so I think that shows that even, even when we're in tribulation, even when we are suffering, God knows it. Yeah. He knows it. And he's there. Yeah. And he's reminding us it will happen in different ways, but it's okay. Yeah. Because it, he says we have poverty, but we're rich. Yeah. That's good. And you know, that that tells us too that tribulation doesn't mean God's not happy with us. That that doesn't mean that oh we, we messed up and so and I, I think about that in, in uh, again as we have this this discussion ongoing about you know, are we growing as a church and, and just um, there's some frustrations there sometimes, but listen, God Sometimes, sometimes you get thrown in jail, but that doesn't mean that, that God's mad at you, you know? And so when we look at our world, things aren't going as well as we hope, well, that doesn't mean that we're not doing well and that God isn't happy with us. And so when we talk about in Isaiah, Isaiah had to go and preach to Israel, and he says, and, and you're preaching to the land desolate, and no, one, no one's going to hear. Sometimes that's, sometimes that's the ministry God gives you, but that doesn't mean he's not happy with you. Because often the problem is my own measuring stick. Right. It's not anything about God. Mm-hmm. It's my yeah. That's right. the way I perceive yeah. it is mm-hmm. all. Yeah. Christ said, "I will build my church." Mm-hmm. That's that's it right there. You know, He said, "I will do it." So if He's not adding to the numbers, then He's not adding to the numbers. Right, and, and there's nothing <laughs> I can do other than. <laughs> Never do anyway, you know. Yeah, if you look at the Acts, uh, right before the ascension, he said, Go to Jerusalem and wait, which we find it hard to wait on God. We always think God needs extra help, but he didn't think that. But go and wait, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, and then he tells us what our job is. Our job is to be witnesses. <coughs> and witnesses don't aren't in control of the belief by the members of the court or the members of the jury. Their job is to witness. Here's what I saw. Here's what I know. Witness to that. And that's what we are to do. And God will give you an increase. Or not. As he, you know, he knows most of the believe. We've got the whole church growth thing on lockdown. We've got to figure it out. And there is a lot of that 
Bless. 